So um, this evening we have a great program for you. I do want to first of all introduce our um, performer. Her name is Joan Gaterna and she will be portraying Deborah Sampson this evening. Joan is the creator of Petticoat Adventures, a series of one-woman shows focusing on the lives of amazing American women. The Petticoat Adventures have been performed at museums, historic sites, and schools throughout the Northeast since 1990 under the auspices of the New England Foundation for the Arts and the Creative Teaching Program of the Massachusetts Cultural Council. The Petticoat Ladies include Mrs. Paul Revere, who gives us a women's view of revolutionary Boston, Mrs. John Quincy Adams, who takes audiences inside one of America's first family, and Johanna Sears, who represent the seagoing women of the ladies who began her amazing, excuse me, of the seagoing women of the great age of sail. Deborah Sampson Gannett was the very first of the petticoat women and the only one of the ladies who began her amazing adventure without a husband to lead the way. Deborah is delighted to share her story with you this evening. Please help me welcome Joan Gaterna as Deborah Sampson. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here tonight. I've been asked to share with you a remarkable adventure of my youth. It's an adventure that brought me some small measure of fame at the time, and I dare say some notoriety as well. And I feel it only fair to warn you that I intend to speak frankly about that adventure tonight. If there's anyone here of an especially sensitive uh, persuasion, now is your chance to take your leave. Anyone? Well, you're all with me then. Um, I will, of course, share with you the nature of my adventure, exactly what I did. And that is that at the age of 21, one day I abandon my petticoats and instead I dressed myself in breeches, a large, roomy linen shirt, a waistcoat. I pulled my hair back into a queue, put a trichon hat on my head, and took the name of Robert Shirtliff. And under that name, I enlisted in the Continental Army and fought as a soldier for some 17 months, undiscovered as a woman. So there you have it. That is what I did. But what I would share with you tonight is rather why I did it, for that's the question I am most oft times asked. And in order to tell you that, I really must ask you to travel back with me to the 1760s of my childhood. I was the fifth child born to my parents. I'm named for my mother, Deborah, and my father was Jonathan Sampson. What can I say about my father? Shall I put it this way? He was not the most reliable of men. Um, I think it's safe to say that his main contribution to the family was the creation of the children, if you take my meaning. I really have no clear memory of him. He was off times away on one uh, wild goose chase or another, but he was around enough so that I had a younger brother, Nehemiah, by the time I was aged four. Now, I do remember one night when Nehemiah was just beginning to toddle about. Mother and father had a terrible quarrel, a dreadful quarrel. And I can remember father rolling up some of his things into a bundle and storming out of the house. It was but the next day when mother asked all of the children to stay at the table after supper. And she told us that father had gone for a sailor. He was seeking his fortune in a new way and that she was expecting another babe. And my mother was truly worried that she wouldn't be able to feed and care for all of us. And so she had decided that one of us would need to be sent away to live with someone else. And she chose me. I was five. Now, as a mother myself, I can understand her choice now. She needed my brothers to work the fields. My sister Hannah was a bit older, could be of assistance to my mother, and of course Nehemiah was just a babe. But still, I think you can imagine how that felt. It was my good fortune 
to be taken in by a relative by the name of Fuller. I called her cousin. She was an elderly maiden lady. And I must tell you that I rather enjoyed my time with her. Do you know, for the first time in my life, I slept in a real bed up off the floor all by myself with my own quilt. And cousin began to teach me my letters and my numbers. I was rather fussed over for the first time in my life. But of course, inside I was wondering, when will father return? Mother had baby number seven. That was a little girl named Sylvia and still no word from my father. And then one day word did come. I was told that my father had drowned, that the ship he'd signed on to had gone down in a terrible storm off the coast of Nantucket. Mother was forced to put out my brothers and sisters at that point into other homes as well. And I counted myself lucky to have such a kind benefactor as cousin. But she was an elderly woman, and when I was eight, she died. Now there was nothing for a girl in a position like that back in those days, but to be set out as a servant. And they didn't keep me there in Plimpton or Plymouth, where at least I knew the families. Oh no, they sent me all the way to Middleborough. Is there anyone here present from Middleborough? Do you know the place? Trust me, you're not missing much. Don't worry about it. Uh, it's a rude country sort of place. Uh, the family that I was placed with was named Thomas. They lived some distance out of town on a farm. Uh, they had a flock of sons, no daughters. I suspect the mistress was rather glad to see another female in the house, but of course all the chores of a girl child fell to me. There was spinning, naturally, and I was also taught to weave. Uh, there was sewing, of course, cooking, tending the animals. Now, those were my chores on a typical Monday. On Tuesday, there might be some spinning. I'd do a little weaving. There'd be sewing, cooking, tending the animals. Uh, but then you come to midweek. And I'd begin with, let's see, some spinning, some weaving, some sewing, some cooking. Tending, tending the animals. Yes, you get the drift. Day after day, the sameness of my chores. You know, it wasn't the sort of life for a child like me. I confess, for all my father's shortcomings, I think I have something of his quest for adventure in me. I was a curious child. Now, the boys in the family had chores, of course, but they were allowed to go off to the little village schoolhouse. And one day, I asked Mr. Thomas if I might go as well. <laughs> and he laughed at me. He said, why, Deborah, you already know how to write your name. Now that's more than my own good wife knows. He was not a believer in education for women. You can be a good wife and a mother without knowing how to write. And so I had to content myself with asking the boys to share their lessons with me when they came home. And that is how I learned, really. I was never allowed to go to school. Now, on occasion, I would be sent up to the village, to the tavern, which was something of a wayside for travelers, and I'd hear tales, oh, tales of the things going on in Boston in those days. There was the night that the boys were throwing snowballs at the soldiers, the king's men, just up the street from here. Why, one of the stable boys from the tavern had been there that night, seen the whole thing happen. The crowd taunted the soldiers till they raised their muskets and fired into the crowd. I'm sure you all recall the Boston Massacre. And imagine, one of the stable boys from the tavern in Middleborough was right there. He saw the whole thing happen. Was I there, my friends? No, I wasn't. Because I was in Middleborough, and I was spinning and weaving and sewing. Oh, there was news of other events as well. The one that began right here in this very place where a crowd gathered and decided to storm out those doors down to Griffin's Wharf and throw a whole lot of tea into Boston Harbor. Yes, there were all manner of boys from the country that had come into town and gotten involved in such things, but not a girl like me, for I was spinning and weaving in Middleborough. And I can tell you, my friends, I thought it would never end. But on my 18th birthday, I was free. I was a free woman, accountable to no one, not father, not husband, no longer master. 
And I had ideas. I had plans. I thought I might like to travel to Boston and see some of the sights. But I learned very quickly that a woman doesn't travel unescorted without ruining her reputation. And I also learned very quickly that even a free woman is not welcome to speak out, to ask questions. I was a misfit in my freedom. Of course, now I had to make a living for myself, no longer being a servant, so I took up the loom and the wheel and made my living as a spinner and a weaver for a time. Do you know, I was even asked to teach a summer session in the very school where I'd never been allowed to go. Of course, when the fall came along, they hired a young man to take my place. So it was back to the spinning wheel. But all that while, I had in the back of my mind that there must be something more than this. Now, I don't know how many times I had seen in my travels, for now we were, of course, at war for our independence, these broadsides urging people to enlist in the Continental Army. And I don't know what made me stop and read carefully one day the text of this, but I would share some of it with you. If you will enlist as a soldier, you get a free uniform, blue and white, an ample daily ration. They promise you $60 a year in gold and silver money, but this is the best part. You have the opportunity of spending a few happy years viewing the different parts of our beautiful continent. This was the very sort of opportunity of which I dreamed. And I knew that I was all the things required, brave and healthy and young and strong, save, of course, one requirement, not a man. But with my skill at the loom and the needle, I decided I didn't need to let that stop me. I made myself the clothes I needed, and one day I left behind, as I've said to you, my petticoats. I dressed myself from head to toe as a young man, took the name of Robert Shirtliff, and made my way out to Bellingham, where they were recruiting soldiers. It was a simple enough thing to sign my name on the enlistment book and become Private Robert Shirtliff of the Continental Army. No questions asked. My little company was marched out to the Hudson River Valley, there was trouble with the loyalists out there. And you know, I found much to my amazement all the qualities which were so undesirable when I was dressed in petticoats suddenly became an asset. My curiosity, my thirst for adventure, my outspokenness, I volunteered for all manner of expeditions. And on one of these scouting parties, scouting expeditions if you will, we engaged in a skirmish in which I was wounded with a musket ball. Now, this presented me with a sore dilemma. I had three choices as I saw it. You will forgive me if I don't specify exactly where this musket ball wounded me. Um, shall we suffice it to say that any doctor who was to examine my wound would have no doubt as to the true gender of Robert Shirtliff. Shall we let it lie at that? Now, my dilemma was, should I just leave the ball in place and hope that my wound would not fester? I'd be risking my life to do that. Should I present myself to the doctor and let myself be discovered, uncovered as it were? And then, of course, my life as a soldier would come to an end and I knew not what punishment might await me. But as I pondered my dilemma, I realized there was a third way. And that, my friends, is the way I chose. I decided to remove that musket ball with my own hand, which I did. And fortune smiled upon me, my wound healed up just fine, and I was able to continue my service for some several more months. In the end, I was discovered as a woman, felled by a fever, they tell me I was so sick that they didn't know if I was dead or alive. And so they sent for the doctor. Now this time I was in no position to avoid him. He bent over and he opened my waistcoat. He opened that fulsome linen shirt. He bent down to listen to see if my heart was still beating. And he came up a very surprised man. Credit the doctor, he did not reveal what he'd discovered. 
had me wrapped up and carried back to his own home where I was cared for and regained my strength. But of course he did report to my superiors his discovery about the true nature of Robert Shirtliff. And so I was dismissed from the army, but given an honorable discharge, my friends, no punishment, an honorable discharge. Oh, how I wanted to go back to Middleborough and show them this honor. But I sensed that I would not be welcome there. And so I instead headed for the little town of Sharon where I had a relative. She took me in and it was my custom to work out in her garden, still wearing my soldier's breeches in those days. Ladies, I do recommend them. They are a much more practical garment than your petticoats. And it was one day as I was working in the garden that I came to be acquainted with a young man of that town by the name of Benjamin Gannett. Now, Ben Gannett wasn't one bit shocked or horrified by what I'd done. In fact, I think he was rather taken with my courage and my sense of adventure. And you might not be surprised to know that within the year, Ben and I were married. We've been married a long time now. I am the mother of three children, and we've recently taken in an orphaned neighbor, so there are four children under our roof. Um, and ladies, I do confess to you, though I proved in my youth that we can go beyond our domestic sphere, as it were, um, most of the time these days, I am at home spinning and weaving and sewing and cooking and caring for my children and my animals. But I must leave you with the most um, exciting development that's come to me of late. I have been approached by a gentleman from Dedham by the name of Herman Mann. He proposes two things, to write a book about my adventure, which he will sell by subscription, and then he proposes to write an address for me that I put on my old uniform, stand up on a stage, go through the manual of arms with my musket. He thinks that people would actually pay as much as 25 cents a piece to see me do this. Um, he suggests the Federal Street Theater right here in Boston as a starting point, and then perhaps I might tour out through Worcester and Springfield and head up to Albany, uh, see some of my old friends from the Hudson River Valley. Um, I confess, the book was of interest to me. I was somewhat reluctant about the speaking tour. But you know, you have been so kind to me tonight in your reception that I am looking rather favorably upon the idea right now. I think I shall tell Mr. Mann that I'm open to the suggestion. So there you have it, my friends. That, in short, is my notorious adventure and where it has brought me to. And I thank you all for your kind attention to my tale. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Donald Yakovo, and I work in the Publications Department the Massachusetts Historical Society, and the Society is um, very grateful for the opportunity to co-sponsor uh, tonight's event. And I am really deeply honored to have the opportunity to introduce two of the best historians now writing in this country. Alfred F. Young, Professor Emeritus at Northern Illinois University and Senior Research Fellow at Chicago's Newbury Library has written or edited about nine books and is an authority on the American Revolution. You are about to meet one of the prime shapers of modern scholarship in the field of American history. With Staunton Lynn, Jesse Lemich, Al Young confronted the power structure of the historical profession and demanded change. It would take too long to describe the state of American history before the advent of what we might call the Young Turks of the 1960s. Suffice it to say, it wasn't pretty. Through their work and others, such as Herbert Gutman, the voice of ordinary people in history became heard. His first book, The Democratic Republicans of New York, looked at history and the development of democracy from the bottom up, setting an example for succeeding generations of scholars. If the questions he and his colleagues insisted that historians ask about race and class are no longer considered radical, 
in our perhaps in Alan Taylor's words, quote, almost conventional, really what we now expect from historians, it is because of Al Young's work. Some of you know his previous book on George Robert Twelve, uh, Twelve Hughes, Hughes, excuse me, The Shoemaker and the Boston Tea Party, Memory and the American Revolution. His new book, which we uh, celebrate tonight, is an astonishing story. It is a mark of the book's success that the very well-known and famous scholarly journal, Entertainment Weekly, reviewed Professor Young's book, describing it in terms that its readers could understand. Mulan and a tricornered hat. Can Hollywood be far behind? Indeed not. Los Angeles-based Dream Entertainment has option rights to the book, as I understand it. It is not hard to see why. Deception, gender bending, cross-dressing, war, revolution, sex, sounds like a script to me. If ever the phrase, the clothes make the man, was applicable, it is now. But let Professor Young tell you the story. Thank you very much for that generous introduction. I'm going to talk softly, yell if, uh, if you can't hear. Uh, I have some kind of throat ailment and I occasionally give out. Uh, don't be, I'm, I'm drinking tea, don't be alarmed if, uh, in, in honor of the place. I've been uh, thinking lately, reflecting on what's going to happen to Deborah Sampson next. My book covers in four parts young Deborah Sampson, Robert Shirtliff, the celebrated Mrs. Gannett, as she called herself when she went on tour, the rest of her life, and her passing into history, what Americans have made of her over 200 years. She's someone, like other women in American history, and I'm quoting Gloria, Gloria Steinem, said, a lost, recovered, re-lost, recovered, again, re-re-lost, and re-recovered. And each time it happens, She's seen through the prism of different eyes. So as I now read the reviews that are coming in from the serious ones like Entertainment Weekly to Alan Taylor's in the New Republic of last June, I'm reflecting on what scholars are making of her. And now that I've signed a contract with a movie maker to make a movie, I'm curious as to what he's going to make of her. So it may be that we're entering another stage of the public memory of Deborah Sampson, and I'll come back to this. I um, sort of half stumbled on Deborah Sampson about 20, 25 years ago. Um, I was editing, I was the general editor of a series of documentary, in America, America, text, documentary sources in American history, and Gerda Lerner was doing what was really the first volume of sources in women's history. And she included in the manuscript the petition that Deborah Sampson, one of them, sent to Congress asking for her pension. And I said to her, uh, Gerda, this woman is so idiosyncratic. Why do you want to put her in? I mean, you know, I couldn't have been more wrong. She stuck to her guns, and that was one of the first appearances in modern scholarship of Deborah Sampson. I stumbled, I didn't start out to do a book about her. I stumbled across a strange memoir written of her by Herman Mann in 1797 
while I was preparing an exhibit for the Chicago Historical Society on Ordinary People in the Revolution. And I browsed through it. I couldn't make any sense of it. He has her at the Battle of Yorktown, which is fought in October 1781. And then he includes in the appendix a document showing that she enlisted in May of 1782 after the battle was all over. He has her on wild adventures among Indians, including an adventure among Indians in western Pennsylvania who were cannibals, he said, and were about to devour her. But she defied them, and when they brought in a captive woman, uh, which, whom they'd caught, and were about to put her into the boiling pot, she saved her by promise, as Robert Shirtliff, promising to marry her. Cannibals. Western Pennsylvania. He also included an episode in Philadelphia where a young woman falls in love with Robert Shirtliff. Robert Shirtliff, after something of an exchange, leaves, promises to come back, and never comes back. No proof of this at all. Man, to me, was clearly an unreliable source. Oh, I. I didn't know what to make of it, and we, we were choosing people to uh, do sort of portraits of them in the exhibit. We put her aside. We just put the book on exhibit in a section called Veterans Remember the Revolution. And that was the end of that for a while. I thought about her when I was asked to do a paper for a conference, and I thought, oh, this will be a snap. I'll go back, work through Herman Mann. Uh, collect what other documents I could, and there would be a neat story that had never been done. That was in uh, 1993. Uh, Eleven years later, here I am. Uh, she defeated me at first. It's so difficult to do research. I took time off. I did that little book on the shoemaker and the tea party, which was a, which was a snap compared to this book. I was able there to peel off the memoirist from the shoemaker and then take the shoemaker who was 93 years old and sift through his memory to what, to what was the reality. But for Deborah, as I looked around for sources, there was a diary for one year, the year she was on her lecture tour, an account book and a diary. Nothing of anything in the army. There were two letters that survived, one written to Paul Revere asking for a loan of $10, and one written to another creditor saying, hold on until I can get back to you. There were three letters, there were no letters to her at all. There must have been some, but they haven't survived. I found three letters about her over this entire life one by Paul Revere, one by a pension agent in the, in the town of Dedham, and one which was this long in a newspaper after she died, which really set me back. It was by her former drill sergeant, and this was written in 1827. He said of Herman Mann's book, it was a novel not one-fourth of which was true. But that wasn't a counsel of pessimism. Rather, my question was, which was the fourth which was likely true? I can't say I worked out a strategy, but as it turned out, when I met the 80-odd-year-old great-great great-granddaughter in Middleborough, and she had said, oh, would you like to see the deeds of the family land? Said, oh, would you like to see the furniture that I took from, that was passed down to me from Deborah's house? Uh, oh, here's a scrapbook that I've kept for the last 70 years about Deborah Sampson. She said, you ought to see um, Beatrice Bostock in Truro. She has a diary. You know, nothing makes a historian salivate more than a diary. I ran down Mrs. Bostock. 
I entered a little house with which she's living with with her daughter, and she said, "Oh, you must be one of those women's libbers, women libbers." She was in her 80s, and she had a twinkle in her eye. She showed me the diary. It was not a diary by Deborah, but she said, "Would you like to see a dress that was passed down to me, belonged to Deborah?" And she brought out a lovely uh, ankle-length dress in a crew with blueprints on it, uh, well tailored. Immediately brought in a costume historian who knew uh, about dating costumes. She said, "This is a, this is an 18th century dress." I said, "Do you want to give me a uh, a guess as to the uh, likely date?" They can do that in, in term, by measuring style against uh, what's known in existing patterns. She said, "This is a dress of 1785." I said, "Are you sure?" I said, "Could this be a wedding dress?" She said, "Oh yes, that might be the, a kind of dress that a country girl would wear." She had picked the date on which Deborah got married. Now, the point is that when you start to discover things like this, well, you keep looking and you keep looking, and I guess that's why it took, you know, all these years. My strategy, as it worked out, was to emphasize three things. One, the context of her life, because for the most part I didn't know uh, what, what she, how she herself would have felt. The context of being a soldier at that time of the war, in the Hudson Valley, in the light infantry, out of West Point, making excursions into Westchester County. The context of living in Middleborough, which was a town that had a major struggle with one of the leading Tories of New England, Peter Oliver, whose mansion and estate dominated the town. A town in which there were women weavers taking over the trade of weaving. A town which was the center of Baptist life in New England. Had the mother church of the Baptist churches of New England and Isaac Backus, the leading campaigner for religious liberty for the Baptists in New England. This was the town. And so I was interested in the context that might affect Deborah Sampson to make her a rebel, to make her do this daring, uh, very unusual thing. I was also interested in what one historian, Carlo Ginsburg, calls unintentional clues, slender clues, inadvertent clues, the sort of thing that Sherlock Holmes finds, the sort of little clue that Sigmund Freud finds, that were not intended by the person. And thirdly, it was very apparent to me that there were lots of things left from her life, not only the dress, but I could visit the house she was born in, the house she was an indentured servant in, the house she lived in for the last 14 years of her life. And one day I realized as I was being taken around the farm, walked through the meadow land, walked through the forest land of an 80 acre farm that I was on the farm that she lived in. And this, I could, with the help of the farmer who was himself interested in agricultural history, could reconstruct what her life would be like without documents, without uh, the Deborah Sampson papers. There were no papers at all. I was interested in three or four questions. Obviously, why does she do this? Secondly, how did she get away with it in the army? But thirdly, it soon became clear to me that what she did after the army was as much pioneering and as much ahead of other women as what she did in going into the army. And so I wanted to figure out how did she do how what would call the second and third phases. This woman 
was unusual, not just in her youth at age 21 and 22, but for the rest of her life. And finally, I was very interested in what people had made of her over the 200 years, which I'll come back to. Take the way I played with these uh, problems of evidence with this first question. Uh, why did she do it? Joan, will you allow me to em embellish or add a little bit to your account of young Deborah? One of the first things I discovered was that cross-dressing by women in the 18th century well, I searched for a word. It wasn't common, but neither was it terribly, terribly unusual. You look at what the women scholars have written about women in England in the 18th century, and you discover there are several dozen women who went into the army disguised as men. And in fact, there are three or four books, memoirs by them, or allegedly by them, like The Adventures of Hannah Snell. Push a little bit more, and you discover that The Adventures of Hannah Snell were known in New England, were talked about in the newspapers, or otherwise came up. Secondly, I discovered that in the American colonies, women cross-dressed as men, women from the laboring classes to escape. And gradually, as I bothered one scholar after another who worked on a tangent of this, I discovered that the newspapers had ads for runaway indentured servant women who were disguised as men. There were items about women slaves who escaped disguising themselves as men. There were court records of women who were, had fled a town, who'd gotten pregnant, fled a town out of shame, ended up court brought back. There was one court record in Massachusetts of a woman who was indicted because she dressed as a man and courted another woman. But that was one of about a dozen uh, events which showed up. As far as I could make out, most of these acts of disguising as a man were not acts out of desire or sexual intent, but rather were acts of desperation. People trying to avoid to get out of a difficult situation. That, in a way, fits in with what was happening to Deborah in Middleborough. She, be, she became a rebel, and she left town, not when she was an indentured servant and at the bottom and under a master, but when she was on her own as a weaver, going from house to house, meeting with other women, making an income of her own, and not beholden to any man, a masterless woman. She first expressed herself in rebellion as a Baptist. It's very hard to set ourselves back in the religious framework of 18th century America. In Middleborough in the 1780s, there were several hundred people who were joining the Baptist church. They first, they had the first Baptist, then they had the second and the third Baptist church, and there was several hundred people flocking into the Third Baptist Church, which Deborah joined in about the same time. One scholar has counted noses and has looked at tax records to see who these people were, and what do you know? Most of the people who were joining the Baptist Church were poor, and a major hunk of them were women. Now, the Baptist Church in Middleborough was not like this kind of church. This is what the Congregational Church would also have been like in Middleborough, where 
Peter Oliver, the wealthiest man in town, and his son would have bought the best pews in the church and where you'd be graded back according to what you could afford, where black people sat over there, where the few Indians in town were over here, where the young people were segregated there, with the boys there and the girl. So the Congregational Church was a kind of exquisite lesson in social class and inequality. Baptist Church, well, they didn't have a third Baptist Church. They met under the trees or they met in someone's home. And everyone was brother this or sister that and sisters this or that could stand up in church and challenge the minister whether he had the word of God within him. It was a community. Deborah, who had no family, who was on her own, joined this community. It was for her an act of rebellion against the congregational church, and it was joining a church which in that day and age taught her lessons in resistance to established authority. It, it was in the middle of constitution making. Massachusetts adopted a constitution in which the Congregational Church was established and Baptists were required to pay taxes whether or not they were members of the Congregational Church. One man in Attleboro, that was away from the next town over from Middleboro, uh, refused to pay his taxes. He was carted off to jail. What we would call civil disobedience. Deborah would have known about this. So she, as I see it, would have been taught by the Baptists in, in an individual fighting an injustice that he or she thought had to be resisted. Now, when Deborah had her first episode of cross-dressing, which, which she tried to enlist in Middleborough and was caught, she faced the possibility of criminal prosecution. It was against the law to dress in the clothing of the opposite sex of a man, a woman, or a woman, a man. And for the Baptists, as for the Congregationalists, it was against the teaching of Deuteronomy. It was an abomination. And to the Baptist Church, in which Deborah had been welcomed as a sister in an equality, conducted an inquisition into her. Was she, was she or was she not guilty of this act? Does she or does she not repent of her loose and unchristian ways? She refused to recant and she refused to deal with these elders of the church. They threatened her with excommunication and within several weeks, she had put on men's clothing <clears throat> and left town. It doesn't contradict your story, but it adds a certain dimension. And it takes a little bit, what should I say, of the modern sensibility about cross-dressing out of this woman and gets us back into the 18th century. She was a woman who wanted more out of life than to be a housewife and a mother and have seven, eight, or nine children and stay in Middleborough for the rest of her life. <clears throat> I don't think she knew what she wanted, but she knew she had to get out of town and she knew the army was an opportunity uh, which beckoned. She was a woman of unusual skills and talent. Paul Revere, in later life, 20 years after she goes into the army, says of her, she is a woman of handsome, handsome talents. And she is educated to the point <clears throat> where she deserves much better in life than her present status. I think that she was a woman of handsome talent in the very beginning. How else could you get away with 17 months in the army? disguising yourself and keeping it to yourself. <clears throat> Let me take one more example of answering a big question about her with the kind of evidence that I could find. How did she get away with it? Um, 
I traveled around West Point and the camp in New Windsor, which is reconstructed in part, and which the camp above West Point where she was stationed, who was said to be stationed, is a reconstructed hut with logs. I walked into it. There were spaces, bunks for eight, six to eight soldiers, a fireplace at one end. <clears throat> Seems very cozy. There were 700 such huts, the best constructed huts of the revolution, of the war. It was the end of the war and nothing like Valley Forge. Although Herman Mann said it was, her feet were bleeding in the snow and so forth. Not true. When I walked out of the house, <clears throat> I said to my niece and my grandniece, this is a hoax. It wasn't possible. How could she possibly have gotten away for a winter winter of 82, 83, with snow on the ground, two or three feet, and everybody forced to stay in the huts. I'd fallen for something. There was something basically wrong with the story. And that set me back to some of my sources. And the question I had in my mind was, where was she in that winter of 82, 83? And I look back to the first account of her in a newspaper in 1784, which was obviously coming from her, from her, from her, but written by one of her officers, who was her, one of her commanding officers at the time at West Point. A short newspaper article in, the, in a New York newspaper without a signature. And the officer said of her, she displayed herself with activity, alertness, chastity, and valor. She was a vigilant soldier on her post and always gained the admiration and applause of her officers, was never found in liquor, always kept company with the most upright and temperate soldiers. For several months, this gallantress served with credit as a waiter in a general officer's family. There it was. They'd reconstructed at uh, New Windsor the soldiers, one of several of the soldiers' huts. They didn't reconstruct the officers' much larger, much more commodious huts. Who was the officer? One of these inadvertent clues. In her diary in, 17, in 1803, after she travels all the way across New England to Albany, to upstate New York, goes down the Hudson Valley, and at Catskill turns west and travels for a hundred miles into the New York frontier, and she tells us to spend time with General Patterson, and she calls General John Patterson my old friend. Really neat. I went back to Mann to see what he says about this episode, being a waiter in a uh, general officer's family. And I realized he reprinted that article in his appendix. But he edited it. So the sentence really was, she served, the original sentence, she served with credit as a waiter in the general officer's family. Herman Mann, the prevaricator, the twister, takes out as a waiter. A waiter means a servant or an orderly. He was embarrassed in telling this grand account of the heroine at Valley, at the Ra'am. Yorktown and so forth, and the heroine who'd engaged in all of these skirmishes, by having her end up as a servant to a general. So he just takes it out. But in truth, she loved being a waiter. And a waiter actually, in terms of language, is a rather elevated term for a uh, servant. It's sort of 
a waiter would feel that he has been set aside from other ordinary soldiers in the infantry. So the answer to one of my questions about her, how did she get away with it, she fought in the light infantry, and with a great deal of searching in military records, I could establish where her company was, and that she very likely was in three separate skirmishes. But when she came back at the end of 82, she probably didn't stay for long in one of those huts because through most of 1783, she was General Patterson's waiter. And the fact that she called him my good friend was a clue that here was one of the ways in which she had solved her problem of the tension, the daily tension of possibly being discovered. She was a very good soldier. And to finish this part of the story, when Patterson said of her, and I believe it was Patterson who wrote the article, She was a remarkably vigilant soldier on her post and always gained the admiration and applause of her officers. He was saying something which he could not say about a good many soldiers in the American army in 1782-83. And this was a context that surprised me and enabled me to combine the small clues with the large clues. What was the army like in 1782-83? They were deserting. In 83 they were taking leave as soon as they knew there was peace. And they were engaged in mutiny. Mutiny. We don't like to dwell on that part of the American Revolution. Why was Deborah in Philadelphia in 1783, where, after I ran down the medical records, I could discover there was the doctor and the nurse whom she, cl man claimed, was, was, took care of her. There was a mutiny in the Philadelphia line in 1783, and Washington sent General Patterson and 1,500 soldiers to put down the mutiny, and Deborah went with him. Why? Because she was a loyal soldier. And she never associated with those who were found in liquor and always kept company with the most upright and temperate soldiers. Mutiny or desertion never crossed her mind. So my larger conclusion, but you have to read the chapters to, to be convinced, is that she got away with being a woman disguised as a man in the Revolutionary Army because she was one of the best male soldiers in the army. And so she cast off all attention by being so good. You don't have to be convinced. But if you're not convinced, see if you can come up with an alternate way of explaining her. Now I also take up you know, how she dealt with uh, sanitary conditions, how she might have dealt with menstruation, how she might dealt with all the things you want to know about, which they're in the book, okay? Uh, but that seemed to me to be the least of it. The larger question was, how do you get away with it? And one of her officers also used a phrase for her, which I thought put it right, hit the nail on the head. She was a faithful soldier. Faithful. Well, you said that because not all soldiers at the end of the war were faithful. She stood out by being a patriot. Now, that gives you some idea of how I've worked on the story. Now I'll come back to how do we add this up and what do we make of her, and I'll end.
When I started out, I thought Herman Mann, the memoirist of 1797, was a great con man, that he was telling stories to make money, to give himself a reputation. He was just starting out as a printer in Dedham. And that he was, well, that Deborah was an innocent victim of his tall tales. But she talked to him, and he took about three years to write that book. She let him write the address that she gave to about a few thousand people. And in the address, she says, it may be his words, but she said it, I was at Yorktown. I was at the Battle of White Plains. She wasn't even in the, anyways, near the army. I went with, with my troops to rescue General Schuyler from the Indians in northern New York. In other words, she delivered Herman Mann's stories about her. And then for the next 25 years, she was on good social terms with Herman Mann and his family. And in the last years of her life, she lets Herman Mann come in to do a revised version of her life. That suggests to me, well, there's more to the relationship or there's more to the role of Deborah with the writing of her life story than I thought there was at the beginning. And there may be more to her relationship with General Patterson and more to her relationship with her husband. She happened to marry the son of the wealthiest man in town. He turned out to be a terrible dud, and she was a poor farmer. He was a poor farmer and a washout as a person. As Paul Revere said, a man of a little force in business. But then again, he had a very strong wife. What might happen to Deborah if this way of thinking about her gets adopted by others? And here is where I'll end. Alan Taylor, in his review in the New Republic, which is very flattering and goes on for six pages. If you don't want to read the book, you could read the, the summary in the New Republic of June of this year. He says, Samson expressed her agency by manipulating and deceiving others. She went down to see Philip Freneau in New York to get him to do a to petition to Congress. Freneau warmed to her bold self-promotion. She was a shrewd manager and promoter. engaged in deception and manipulation. Those aren't my words, but he read my book, or he read the biography that way. Which I think adds a dimension. I have it there, but I didn't emphasize it. And it interested me that the movie producer of Dream Entertainment, in his letter to me, said something similar. I could easily picture her as a living person, changing and growing throughout her life, and rising to the occasion in many instances, leaving an everlasting impact. Dramatically speaking, we have a great character here with both heroic traits and flaws, whose actions in every great drama changes her life and other lives forever. She is a hero, but if I may continue your conclusion, he's writing to me, she is an ordinary hero, an unexpected hero, even to herself, ironically, the opposite of the heroine Herman Mann's novel tried to portray. So, if Yitzhak Ginsburg has his way with the movie, Maybe we'll have a movie that can do something which the biography did not do, but look at her by walking around her, by looking at her through her own eyes and through the eyes of other people. I'm not disheartened by this. I mean, I gave this man a contract because I thought 
It was a sophisticated way and a very, very un-Hollywood way. Oh, she has lived in New England since 1960. She's the author of three books and many essays in early American history, including A Midwife's Tale, The Life of Martha Ballard, based on her diary, which won the Pulitzer Prize for History in 1991. Her latest book, The Age of Homespun, Objects and Stories in the Creation of an American Myth, builds on her earlier interest in women's history and the everyday lives of early Americans, but adds a new focus on material objects. Uh, not only, if you read her books, you'll realize what a great scholar she is, but if you go to um, the web at, web at Harvard at Home, you can see what a wonderful teacher she is as well. Uh, in fact, I think she's the only professor I know of that has not one but two websites <laughs> devoted uh, to her work. Uh, some people know her best for her one-line quote, well-behaved women seldom make history. It appears on bumper stickers, t-shirts, and other unlikely places. That quote is the starting place for her current book in progress, which includes a chapter on the difficulties of including well-behaved women in the history of the American Revolution. And tonight, she'll give us a bit more of a context to understand Deborah Sampson. Thank you. I feel really honored to be on this program because I'm a great fan of Al Young. Um, and I very much enjoyed Joan's presentation of Joan Sampson and admire someone who's bringing women's history to so many people in such a refreshing way. My little talk tonight, and I will try not to talk very long so that we can have a conversation really focuses on a larger question, and one that Al Young's work addresses wonderfully, both in The Shoemaker and the Tea Party, which is something I teach in my core course on the American Revolution, and also in this wonderful book, Masquerade. I really buy it. It's really terrific. And that is, how do we know what we know about the past? He's a detective, it's Sherlock Holmes, but he doesn't just give us his conclusions. He helps us understand the evidence and how we get to those answers. And he also has very thoughtful things to say about the concept of historical memory. Historians sometimes like to distinguish between documented history the kind of things that Al does and that those of us in the field like to do. And, and the more sort of informal, popular memory that's passed on through films, through television programs, through word of mouth, through advertisements, person to person, the, the kind of popular perception. And that's, that's what I want to talk about tonight, popular perceptions of women in the American Revolution. And I'm going to focus on the most famous woman of the American Revolution. And I'd like to start by telling you about an interesting experiment that a history professor named Michael Frisch conducted in his classrooms in um, New York University, in upstate New York State University. He began in 1976 and continued for about eight or nine years. At the beginning of each semester, giving his students a little quiz, very simple, little quiz. He asked them to write down the first 10 names that came into their minds at the prompt American history from the beginning through the Civil War. Wrote down the 10 names. And he said, now, turn over the page and do the same thing, but this time exclude presidents, generals, and statesmen. Now, the results were really interesting and not too surprising. 
On the first side of the page, George Washington was at the top of the list, followed by Abraham Lincoln, Thomas Jefferson, Ulysses S. Grant, and so on, the national heroes, the presidents, and the statesmen, and the generals. On the second list, however, in seven of the eight years, Betsy Ross was number one. And the one year where she was number two, he had forgotten to use the word statesman in the instructions and Benjamin Franklin moved ahead. So it seems quite clear that in that experience, the most famous American who was not a statesman, a general, or a president was the Philadelphia seamstress, Betsy Ross. I was so curious about this that I tried it in my, with my own students at the University of New Hampshire in the early 1990s, and I got identical results. I tried it last week with my, on the first day of an introductory um, course on the American Revolution at Harvard, and I'm not going to tell you yet what result I got. We'll come back to that at the end of my comments. If George Washington is the father of our country, Betsy Ross has long been considered our mother. Yet among historians, the Betsy Ross story has um, only slightly more credence than the famous story about little George Washington and the cherry tree. She was a Philadelphia seamstress. She actually lived. She did make ship's flags. But the account of how she and George Washington designed the first stars and stripes first emerged in the late 19th century, a hundred years after the supposed event, and it really is a product of colonial revival imagination. It wasn't 20 years later, as in the case of Horace Mann and Deborah Sampson, it really was in the next century that this story appeared. In 1870, her grandson, a man named William J. Canby, read a paper before the Historical Society of Pennsylvania, and he told the classic story. He had gotten the story, he said he remembered his grandmother well, but he had gotten the, the story from aged relatives. One woman was in her 80s, another in her 90s, who confirmed that in June of 1776, notice that date, month before the Declaration of Independence. George Washington and two other members of the Continental Congress visited Ross's shop on Arch Street in Philadelphia. And they knew there was going to be a new nation and the good General Washington, who didn't have anything else to do in June of 1776, <laughs> wanted a flag. And so he came to Betsy with a rough sketch. And she looked at the sketch and she saw that he had six pointed stars on the flag. And she had a better idea. So she took a piece of paper, she folded it into neat triangles, and with a single clip of the scissors, can be said, she showed him how much easier it would be to cut a five pointed star. And so it was that the first flag was born. Stars and stripes, blue field, five pointed stars arranged in a circle. Last spring, my grandson, Jamie, who was then a fourth grader, told me this story, just as I've told it to you. And he, it, amazingly, he had learned it from the teacher who had given him an otherwise very credible account of the American Revolution and had done something even more important. It had gotten him really excited about the American Revolution. Of course, he goes to Friends Central in Philadelphia. And I suppose there's some latitude for Philadelphia school children believing the Betsy Ross story. But I was a little bit astonished when I opened the recent book by the NPR reporter Koki Roberts called Founding Mothers. She repeats the story just as it appears in a Philadelphia website. And although she acknowledges that historians have doubted this story, uh, she produces what for her is compelling evidence of its veracity, which was, is another memoir first published in a little book called Pioneer Mothers of America in 1912. 
It's pretty disillusioned, actually, to see that. And I'm sure Betsy's story is not going to go away. Why not? Why won't it go away? What? Mythology, yeah, but why? Well, its survival is the most interesting thing about it. And I, I won't go into detail, but it just doesn't add up for many reasons. Not only is the chronology wrong and forced, but some of the most interesting evidence really has to do with the history of the American flag. Betsy Ross didn't make the first American flag because there wasn't one. Um, flag historians tell us that it took a very long time for the flag to become standardized, even though there was a flag resolution a year after this purported event occurred in 1771. In October of 1778, for example, Benjamin Franklin and John Adams actually told the Neapolitan ambassador that, quote, the flag of the United States of Americans consists of 13 stripes, alternately red, white, and blue. And flag sheets from the 1780s and 90s do in fact show flags with three colored stripes. And in some, the field is vertical and along the side. It took a long time for the flag to become standardized. As for those nifty five-pointed stars, a Smithsonian study of all extant flags and flag images from the Revolutionary period tells us that five-pointed stars were very unusual. The flag used in Washington's headquarters actually had six-pointed stars and four-pointed and eight-pointed stars were much more common than five-pointed stars. They really didn't become standard until the early 19th century. To those interested in perpetuating Betsy's story, such details hardly matter. Her house on Arch Street is the most visited site in Philadelphia except for the Liberty Bell and Independence Hall, and it has a quarter of a million visitors annually. Upright historians might quibble about the details, but Betsy and her flag exist beyond history, yes, in myth, in the, in the sanctity of public memory. Now, she's not alone in that. Historians can tell us that Paul Revere never completed his famous ride, but that doesn't prevent millions of Americans from visiting his house, a site that, like Betsy's, was saved by public-spirited citizens in the early 20th century. But unlike Ross, Boston's famous courier has found an existence beyond myth. Biographies of Paul Revere tell us about his life as a silversmith, a political operative, and an entrepreneur. Betsy Ross's champions have much less to work with if we think of what Al Young has done with tiny fragments of information about Deborah Sampson, people have been poring over Betsy Ross' story for uh, uh, more than a century. And so far, there is only one document, a 1770 receipt from the state of Pennsylvania that documents her work as a flag maker. Outside her descendant stories, her life is indistinguishable from the mass of American women who lived through the war, survived widowhood, raised families, and sustained communities. Those women matter. But I'm not so sure we need Betsy Ross in order to tell their story. So why her? Why Betsy? Why has she become the emblem of women in the American Revolution? Well, probably not hard to figure that out. And I like the analysis of Michael Frisch, the scholar who did that original experiment. He says it has to do with her association with the nation's most powerful national symbol, the flag. And in fact, her story became prominent during the very period when veneration of the flag became important in the United States. But then he goes a little further, and I kind of like this analogy. 
He says, in America's civil religion, Betsy Ross occupies the position of the Virgin Mary. And here's, here's how he describes it. He says, an ordinary woman is visited by a distant god and commanded to be the vehicle through their collaboration of a divine creation. And indeed, in the classroom pageants enacted by generations of American school children over the past century, that is exactly what we see. Washington calls on the humble seamstress Betsy Ross in her tiny home and asks her if she will make the nation's flag to his design. And Betsy promptly brings forth from her lap the flag, the nation itself, and the promise of freedom and natural rights for all mankind. So in Frisch's view, the Betsy Ross story survives because we need it. It brings women into the national narrative. And Betsy hasn't had the problem Deborah Sampson had of being discovered and lost and rediscovered and lost and rediscovered and lost again because she fits so comfortably. She brings women into the story without transgressing the boundaries of good female behavior. And she brings women into the story as validators and creators of the national unity, not as separate citizens working for their rights or women left out of the public story. In, in that sense, she's a bit like Pocahontas, another iconic figure that often turns up when people think of early American history, a facilitator of the great national story. Now, I like this explanation, but I think there's another one. And I think it's one that relates wonderfully to Al's account of Deborah Sampson, and particularly to the things he's taught us about the last part of Sampson's life when she began to tell her own story. And of course, we could associate Sampson with another great, iconic American, Benjamin Franklin, who was very much a creator of his own mythology in telling his own story. That is, people that we tend to remember often are a bit of self-promoters. And this, I think, is also true for Betsy, and perhaps especially for Betsy's defenders and her kin, those who first told the story and then others who came to associate it. Let me just give you a couple of examples of that. By the 1870s, when the Betsy Ross story survived, there were hundreds of stories about the contributions of women to the American Revolution. Deborah Sampson's story was told then, many, many others. This was a period of local public history, a period when women particularly were engaged in restoring old houses and collecting artifacts and passing on oral tradition. Most of those stories were forgotten. Betsy's survived. And the real turning point came in 1893. Millions of visitors to the Chicago World's Fair saw a painting by an artist named Charles Weisgerber. And this is the famous painting of Betsy with the flag on her lap. I'm sure you've seen it. And George Washington and the other members of the supposed committee um, are standing before her. In 1898, Philadelphia's Betsy Ross Memorial Association was founded and began a national campaign to restore the house that they believed she had lived in. Probably she never lived there. But the house was restored. And they did something that we're familiar with if we think about the campaign to restore old iron sides or the US Constitution. That is, they enlisted school children. They offered a lithograph certificate and a copy of Weisgerber's picture to anyone who contributed 10 cents not even 25 cents for a lecture, just 10 cents, and you had a certificate that you saved the Betsy Ross house, and by extension, you saved the nation. More than two million persons, most of them children, contributed. 
Weisgerber himself eventually became custodian of the house, and he even Christian christened one of his sons Vexel Domus, Latin for home of the flag. He lived in the house, greeted visitors, and visitors had the pleasure of having little Vexel declaim the patriotic speeches of Patrick Henry, Nathan Hale, and other patriots as he stood on the shop counter. So they were organized, they were savvy, they got into the general public, they got other people invested in promoting this story. And once the story gets going, it's almost impossible to kill it. It's like someone was telling me the other day and talking with middle school students. They said, How do we, where do historians get their information? The students said, from books. Uh, well, where did the writer of the books, where do they get their information? From other books? And that is, of course, where much of the history we read comes from. And once those books got going, they were self-replicating. And because the story was appealing and answered so many needs, it survived. Last year, I received a, an email from a very well-known educational publisher asking me to review a manuscript for a K-4 through four history of Betsy Ross. And I said, well, can you tell me why you're doing this? And they said, because it's in the curriculum. We have to. And it does remain in many, many state curricula for the Revolutionary period, even though from 1870 on, anyone who's looked at it closely knows that it's an invented tradition. Well, one could argue that most of what passes for history is really a form of popular memory. I think uh, we deserve more, which is why I'm so thrilled as we're beginning to create more biographies of ordinary people, not just women, and why I'm so appreciative of Al Young's work. My own sense is that if we understand the past through the biographies of famous people, we learn some important things. We may contribute to national unity, but we also miss so much of the texture and the meaning of life and miss the connections between the ordinary lives that we live and the historical events around us. As we understand Bets, uh, as we understand Deborah Sampson, we understand a lot about the position of servants, about what it meant to be an orphan, about the transmission of popular literature, about the craving of audiences for scandal and excitement and adventure. We learn a lot of history through the life of one person, unique, unusual, ordinary. So what happened at Harvard last week? Well, I did the same experiment. It was very interesting. On the first half of the question, the first 10 names that come in your mind when you think American history from the beginning to the Civil War, 11 of the 13 top vote getters are identical to what was happening in the 70s and 80s. No change. George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Abraham Lincoln, U.S. Grant, James Madison, and so on. I mean, you know, first thing that came into their minds. The additions were fun. Robert E. Lee dropped out for my students, maybe because we're at Harvard. But Sam Adams was there, and of course you know why. <laughs> And John Quincy Adams moved up quite a bit. And I, it might be Amistad, but one of my students thinks it has to do with the constant references to father-son, the two Bushes and the two Adamses. So events make have a slight difference 
but the kind of iconic figures, and these were very powerful correlations. That is, I had 205 students in that um, lecture, and something like 195 of them listed George Washington. And the other top five were all, you know, 150 or so. It was very, very consistent. Well, what happened when I asked them to do the same thing, excluding presidents, generals, or statesmen? What happened was the whole class started laughing very nervously. They were really, really shook them up. And they didn't quite know what to do, which was pretty distressing when you think how hard we've all been working for the past 25 years to try to broaden the meaning of American history. The biggest uh, vote getter, uh, at 40 votes was Paul Revere, who was second in line in the Frisch sample. Betsy Ross dropped down to number seven, which is very interesting, until you sort of look and see what happened on these lists. They're just all over the map. I mean, this is American history to the Civil War, and some people were writing Martin Luther King Jr. I mean, these are... Harvard kids, <laughs> okay, <laughs> was, it was really interesting. But they're also a very clever bunch. And some of them looked up, and I think they saw the professor standing there, and they quickly solved the problem. And there must have been about eight or ten of them who wrote, Mrs. Washington, Mrs. Adams, Mrs. Lincoln, <laughs> Mrs. Jackson. <laughs> So, <laughs> I don't know whether to despair <laughs> or not, but I do think we got to get organized, folks, because it's a kind of a dumb little experiment, but it does tell us that even for our best and our brightest, American history is still national history. It's still focused on presidents, primarily, and that the presidents of the United States exemplify the nation, which is fine if we want national unity. But to me, it's sort of appalling that they can't go from there. So students this semester are going to learn about Deborah Sampson, believe me, and a lot of other things. And they're, of course, going to read Al Young's wonderful book, The Shoemaker and the Tea Party. Thank you. Okay, we're running a little bit over, but I definitely want to give um, you all the chance to ask some questions of our wonderful presenters this evening. So we're going to bring them up for just a few minutes. And because our lecture is being recorded this evening, we'll ask, and for the um, purpose of having everyone be able to hear you, we'll ask that you wait for the microphone, which will be passed around by Donald over here, um, to speak. So if you have any questions, please raise your hand and we'll pass you the microphone. Could either of you talk about some of the counter narratives of um, women's participation in the American Revolution? Uh, for instance, the 19th century feminists uh, must have told a different story that didn't focus on Betsy Ross. The counter narratives. Al? Well, go ahead. Um, okay, is this on? Um, well, what's interesting. <clears throat> I've actually been working on this a bit, and I'm surprised at the stories that the suffragists told. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, 80 Years and More, tells about the male heroes. And if you think of what happened in 1876 at Independence Hall when um, they had a demonstration at the time of the um, centennial of the Declaration of Independence, you know, Susan B. Anthony marched to the front during the celebration and presented a, a Declaration of Women's Rights. And the Declaration at Seneca Falls, of course, was modeled on the um, Declaration of Independence. So it was an interesting way of saying, we were left out, but we're going to model ourselves 
on the heroes, not the heroines, of the American Revolution. Elizabeth Cady Stanton talks about hearing about a male ancestor who was a hero in the American Revolution. Now, there are other examples in the 1890s. There, the uh, Massachusetts Female Suffrage Association did a sort of living tableau kind of thing of women's history. And I was really fascinated at what was in there. Um, Anne Hutchinson, the, the witch hangings, you know, the negative stories of women's oppression. Uh, but Martha Washington, <laughs> Priscilla Mullins, and her spinning wheel. And then they get into abolition and women's activism in the 19th century. So it's a kind of absent history in a funny way, despite the fact that in, for non-feminists, these, these domestic histories of the American Revolution, out of which Betsy Ross comes, were full of stories, but they were multiple. They were about groups of women, ordinary women, tearing their petticoats up to make cartridges, uh, doing a lot of things. It's a much more kind of populous, local history, uh, rather. And when they went to a national history, they sort of uh, uh, managed the, the feminists, I think, ima imagined, as some still do today, either stories about oppression or transgression. Alfred, um, it seems like you had quite a bit of luck. Um, it seems like you'd get to a dead-end road and something would open up and send you down another road and things would come. And uh, how does that work? Because I've seen myself being stuck and saying, okay, universities won't talk to me, people won't talk to me, and it's like you'll find a little thing somewhere. and. Uh, how do you do it? How do you find those little things and keep the faith that you're going to find more? It's the, um, I have five pages of acknowledgement in the back of the book. And at first I thought it was quite pretentious and I was embarrassed by it. And my editor said no. It's okay, because it shows the way you did the book. And while I acknowledge a large number of scholars, mostly ordinary, ordinary people, <clears throat> relatives, people in the secretary of the Congregational Church, Sharon, or the head of the historical commission in Middleborough, who went with me from one house to another looking for, for sites. Um, I don't think it's any special knack. I think, uh, first, it has, you have to really want to do the piece of research and want to find answers and, and have a kind of stick to it. You have to be a little bit crazy. Um, you have to have tenure or <laughs> be retired where you're sort of not beholden to the standards of your, di your discipline, your particular profession. Um, can I it can be that? done. Go I'm ahead. Say, can I build on that? Because I think Al's work is such a wonderful example of where the antiquarian, or, you know, family history, local history, the antiquarian stuff that it's often dismissed as just being wrong, as, as I was doing a bit here with Betsy Ross, is the starting point, place for some fabulous stuff. You know, it's what he does with it. He goes in the unexpected places and then knows what to do with it and how to make it yield insights. question, which is, I don't know, what would be the average marrying age of women in the 1700s, Deborah's time? Uh, I can't do it without my notes. Uh, go ahead. 21. 
I might, I think it's close. Right, it? but rising a little bit yeah. by the end of the century. So that uh, Deborah marries at 25 and she's already on the cusp of being considered an old maid. The, uh, I did get into this and I was interested in she's pregnant before she marries. So what else is new? About 40% of couples in the New England towns conceived their child before they were married. So that's interesting. What was even more interesting, since you raised the question of family history and marriage, I skipped over. She only had three children of her own at a time when most women were having seven, eight, nine. And here's why I said Herman Mann was not entirely to be dismissed. In the appendix to his book, he goes back to see her just before it's published. And he reports a rumor in the neighborhood. He said it is hearsay that she refuses her husband the rights to the marriage bed. What a thing to say about your heroine. But she only had three children and one adopted child. And it's in the 1790s, it's when she's off like gangbusters, to use the wrong image. Her back pay, a pension, a book, a lecture tour. And you don't do that if you have a toddler underfoot, a baby at your breast, and you know. So when I said that she was a, her, the rest of her life is as interesting as being a soldier, there are a lot of things which she may have been pioneering at, like family limitation. Do we know? For sure, no. But, but statistically, that is the period when a lot of demographers think this is beginning to happen, you know, going. Maybe it's just one fewer child, but the birth rate does start to fall in um, settled yeah. parts of the United States by about 1800. So she's a bit of a forerunner there, but not too much. Yeah. The brief comment. Um, read uh, the used book uh, in this book is besides the terrific. Uh, study, the biographies, is that Al Young is so interested in the memory and how that memory plays out. Uh, right down to the present, and we should give him credit for the use figure because he worked very hard with Old South and folks in the National Park Service to try to get it as exactly right as we could, an image, and the only image, extant image of use is a very old man. So I, I think it's, it's too uh, Al Young's credit as a writer, as a historian, and I wish more historians had that commitment to not just look at the past and leave it, but then how does it play out? Uh, thank, thank you, Marty Blatt of the National Park <laughs> Service, who took Hughes under his wing and made an exhibit and uses all over Boston thanks to his efforts. Now we need Deborah right in that niche, right over there. <laughs> Thirty or thirty-five years ago, if there was any reference made or historical note of Deborah Sampson, she was depicted or described as a black American woman. I'm wondering if any of you are aware of that and if you can describe how that came to be from a 1802 lecture circuit white woman speaker to a 1972 uh, black American woman in, in popular history. Um, I can speak briefly to that. In my travels, more than once, I've been asked that question. And the source that's most commonly referred to is some sort of a comic book. Um, and I believe Al can speak in more detail as to how that's refuted. Um, Deborah's genealogy is pretty well known. 
as, as baseline. I was very open-minded on this question and tried to run it down as best I could. And there, there's a, a chapter at the end of the book which deals with, these, with the question, was Deborah Sampson black? Was Deborah Sampson a lesbian? Was Deborah Sampson a feminist? Because these are the things that have been said about her. The story about her being black originates with his first name, William, William Nell, who's an African-American of Boston, who was a crusader for abolitionism, a friend of Frederick Douglass. And he writes the first history of colored people in the American Revolution. And he quotes uh, a black man of 1850 who says he heard his, I think it's grandfather, and another soldier talk about Deborah Sampson. And that's all that he says. I tracked down the soldiers. They were at West Point. They might have heard about Deborah Sampson. But why should they make her black? I think it happened because that was the time when slaves were escaping from the South and being brought to Boston, and a time in which many slaves disguised themselves as something else, including men who disguised themselves as women and women who disguised themselves as black. And I think these black men thought she must be black. Furthermore, she's referred to as an indentured servant, and people have a hard time drawing a line between being a slave and being an indentured servant. We, we have time for one more question. I was wondering, in making of the movie, Al, will you have any influence in the screen <laughs> script or any um, censors or anything? Well, no, you sign over the, the movie, but Yitzhak Ginsburg asked me to be a consultant and oh, it pays me very big bucks to be a consultant. And there's even a clause in the contract that he'll pay my way if I have to go to a site to advise his screenwriter. So uh, uh, the first thing I said to him was, you must see the documentary based on Laurel Ulrich's The Midwife's Tale, which I consider the best movie of any kind about the era of early America, the era of the revolution. And I said, if you want to get it right as to how people looked, what a house was like, what it was to weave, how people talked, you have to read. And sure enough, he, he got it and he said, we'll have to show that to all of our people. Now, maybe he's, you know, he's in the stage where he's being nice to me. But I thought it was a terrific sign. And um, he does not want to make a historic epic. He wants to make the story of a character of a woman. And he wants it to be right as to what the life was like. So that's a good sign. But uh, I'll see you at the opening. <laughs>